It is a privilege to be here today. I thank God that I can be here. Uh, it's always a privilege to be before God's people and before you specifically. Now, Linda, my wife, was scheduled to come with me. Uh, the Knox Reformed Church is just getting started, really. Last week, we invited bunches of people to come. Alex Weir from Greenville, South Carolina, has been helping us each week. And he is there this week in my stead. He's doing Sunday school. He normally does that and the worship service. But he was afraid that, and I can understand it, that some ladies would come by themselves and would feel uncomfortable with just his being there. So Linda decided she volunteered and I agreed that she should stay there in the event that someone should come. So please pray that God will put his hand on the Knox Reformed Church uh, in Knox County. Uh, I like John Knox also, but uh, please pray for the work there. I'll be getting a uh, bulletin insert to you probably this week, maybe the next week for the Home Missions Board. Uh, there's a fifth Sunday offering coming up, and I've got to get it in, get it before you folks before that time, so that you can begin praying for the not for the Home Missions Board. Um, the title of the sermon sermon is really a tear in time. A tear in time. I can see why somebody would say tear in time. The two are spelled exactly alike. But it's a tear in time. And I think you'll understand that once we get going in the message. The uh, first part some of you have heard before, but the rest is, not, uh, is, is new. Anyway, I'm glad to be here today. And today I want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And I want to, to do it through the context of time. Time is my topic. Each of us has time. In a 24-hour day, each of us has the same amount of time. What we do with that time is what matters. Some of us use 24 hours wisely. Others, not so wisely. It's not that time is the principal thing, therefore get time. No, it is wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Wisdom uses time aright. Each of us has time. We exist in time. However, time has not always existed. Time had a beginning, and time will have an ending. Revelation 10, verses 5 and 6 tell us that the angels swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. In eternity, time is not. Thus, time had a beginning, and time will have an ending. Let's look at the start of time. Genesis 1, 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That's an amazing statement. And God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. What did God make? Is there something that God did not make? John 1, 
1 through 3 tells us this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Then in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, Paul writes, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. Call me a wacko fundamentalist. I wear the moniker without apology. I believe the Bible. I believe that God made all that we see and God made all that we don't see. Now, what does that mean? That means that God made all that is and all that is is good in its making. Listen carefully. I have a story to tell. Creation is the beginning of time. Long ago and far away, there was a vast void. It was sort of a no place place. It belonged to God. Into God's void came a bang. It was big. It was audible. Bang called out to light. Exist! And light stood foot front and center and saluted. Before the void, before the bang, void was dark nothing. Old John Milton called God the thunderer. And the thunderer thundered, but man heard not. Thunder echoed across the heavens, and light landed in chaos. Blinding light it was. Had anyone been there but other than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, perhaps the morning stars, no one was there nevertheless. Three agreed as one. God called light good. And the good light of God was first in creation. Day followed day with creation anew each day. Light was first. Then the heavens. And on the second day, all were good. The waters and the land, the grass and the herbs, all were good. The sun and the moon and the stars. Came because God spoke. God thundered again. The creatures in the water and on the land and in the air moved as just, just as God said, just as God willed. Twas willed where will and power are one. On the sixth day, what a day that was. On the sixth day, God grabbed a heaping pile of clay and he pushed up here and he gouged out there and with a mighty blow he put life in one end and it was good. And man stood with love in innocency he looked God in the eye and said thanks. I needed that. And they fellowship together in God's spanking new creation. It was good. The psalmist said in Psalm 139 verse 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, are thy works and my soul knoweth right well. Today, today man's soul exists to praise God for his goodness, for God's goodness. Today, can you say that your soul knows what God did for you was miraculous? When God made you, you were a distinctly good, wondrous, fine creation. All was good and there was joy all around when God waved his hand again and caused his new man to sleep 
while he took out a rib to make man a mate. Now let me tell you, that was good. Isn't God good? And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the first, sixth day. Now, think for a minute. On the first day, on the first day of creation, the wheels of time began to turn. And on the seventh day, God got up to marvel at his work. And here's the principle. If God has that kind of power, then God has power to be who he is. You and I don't have that power. We depend upon God for existence. However, God has power to be who he is, and God has chosen to be good. Infinitely good. God defines goodness. God, God's lim- unlimited goodness is limited to him. Our goodness is derived from God. But derived goodness does not deplete divine goodness. And though man had other potential, man was created good. But what did man do? Just as soon as he could, man fulfilled his other potential. Man fell into sin and brought death into time. God put life in time. Man put death in time. Nevertheless, God was good to preserve his wondrous fine work. It was for his glory that God created creatures like we are and then allowed us to fall from innocence. Creation was the start of time. God's creation marks the beginning of time. The God of creation is also the God of time. He is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. As the God of creation, he created all that is. He hung the stars in black nothing. And as the God of time, he establishes and maintains time. Creation is the start of time. That's the beginning. But let's go to the ending. Look down the tunnel of time and see time's ending. We have the start of time. Now let's look to the end. Of time. That's my second point. The end of time. Listen along as I read aloud. Revelation 20, beginning with verse 11, down through Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, if the beginning of creation started time, It follows then that the end of creation ends time. Now, 
outside, outside the bounds of time and space is eternity. It is the abode of God. Notice again the words of John in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, whom, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no, place, no more place found for them. Now, turn to Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. Daniel 7, verse 9. We'll wait till you finish turning and look up here to look at me again. <laughs> Daniel 7, verse 9. I'll begin reading at that verse. We'll go down through verse 22. Daniel 7, verse 9. Are you ready? I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool his throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire verse 13 I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and the name of and, the, and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him, verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possess the kingdom. Now, I believe that the Father sits on the throne. Having said that, let me say that the Son is there too. In fact, just as at creation, the Holy Trinity is there. But my focus today is on the Son. After all, revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. By the way, revelation is a book of visions. In the 22 chapters in Revelation, the words I saw occur 33 times. Notice, however, chapter 20, verse 11 through 21, verse 1, where there are three times when John says, I saw. Now, Revelation is a book of visions. Let's look at it. Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw, in verse 12, the dead, small and great, Stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the book according to their sins. In Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay. John saw the throne. He saw the dead. And he saw the new earth, the throne, the dead, and the new earth. Each is significant. Each has place in judgment. Let's look at the throne. We'll go through each one of them. Let's look at the throne. There the Father sits. He is the Ancient of Days. Christ is there. He has judged his people and their works of wood, hay, and stubble. Notice, though, that the saints are not among the dead. The saints, perhaps, are at the great white throne. I, I believe they're there. But they are, but as the sheep, they don't sit with the goats on the left wing. God's elect are untouched by the second death. Their works are rewarded. And their place in the right wing is secure. Eternity is theirs. They are not among the spiritually dead who never knew Christ. The saints belong to the Father through Christ. The dead, however, don't belong to the Father that way. The dead do belong to the Father through creation, not through Christ, since the dead were never born again at the great white throne judgment. The dead are made ready for the lake of fire. 
But notice the scene. The Ancient of Days is on the throne. He is the embodiment of holiness. So holy that creation flees his presence. There will be no place found for creation's unholiness. That is, if we can consider holiness a trait for the creation. This one on the throne is so great that the vision of his presence is magnificent, superb, above all any other thing, so that the Ancient of Days absorbs our attention to the point that nothing else matters. Hardly anything else can be seen. Though creation flees, the dead are captive. For them there is no escape. Can they bear his presence? I think not. But let's look anyway, beginning with verse 12, we'll pick it up there. And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the, those things which were written in the book according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There they are, before the throne, the dead cower in unholiness. Indeed, a sight to behold, terror at the one on the throne. They would rather have perdition than have the presence of the one, this one who is so holy. How can they stand? After all, the holy angels hardly bear his presence. Isaiah 6, verses 1, 2, and 3 tell us this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly and one cried unto the other and said holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory how can the lost stand his awesome presence when the seraphim hid their eyes from his glory. The seraphim are affected by his holiness so that they are shamed in his presence. No wonder creation flees. No wonder the lost would flee if they could, but the lost aren't quite ready. The books are opened. The judgment comes without complaint. The loss acquiesce. Everlasting perdition prepared for the devil and his angels is theirs. It's a sad, sad, sad scene. Yet it's a right scene. As God makes no mistakes. So, we have the throne and we have the dead. Now we're still under point number two, the end of time. Let's look now at the third thing that John saw. I call it new things. Revelation 20, 
verse 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Remember now, these are the things that John saw, the throne, the dead, the earth. Now he sees the new earth. And I believe that Revelation 21, 1 is a transition between time and eternity. We've considered the start of time, the end of time, and there was a period that occurred some 2,000 years ago. I don't call it the middle of time or the midpoint of time. Instead, I call it a tear in time. A tear in time. In my mind, I see a tear in time, a rip in time, if you will. Perhaps the tear is not literal, but in my mind, the tear is there. We can say that it is an anomaly, something unexpected, unnormal, outside the bounds of time and space continuum. Have you heard of the time and space continuum? This is the tear of time. There is what is that time and space continuum. In my days, I've heard of it over and over and over again. Maybe it's because of my physics background. I don't know. But I, I've never understood it. Not until recently. Recently, I had been thinking just about this time-space continuum. And this is what I've come up with. I think I can make it clear. In the continuum, time is the measure of passing moments. Time is the measure of passing moments. Space is the location of passing moments. Continuum means they exist together. Where time is, there is space. Where space is, there is time. Time demands space. Space demands time. Both exist or neither exist. Now, each of us has heard of the day of the Lord. We're in comfortable language here. Each of us has heard of the day of the Lord. There are several days of the Lord, and the day... The day of the Lord occurs when God intervenes directly into the affairs of man. Automatically, we think of the, of the eschatological day of the Lord. But there are other days of the Lord. The creation and the flood and the exodus are examples. But I draw your attention to another day of the Lord. Today, I want you to think of the anomaly when eternity stepped into time and space. Both time and space continued as eternity intervened into the fair man's affairs beginning at the Incarnation. The anomaly occurred just as Luke described it in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Today, Luke chapter 1, verse 35 is here somewhere. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now here it is. The Holy Spirit placed God's only Son into the womb of the Virgin as eternity stepped into time and space. It's as if there was a tear in time, a rip in time. It was as if God, as a little baby, 
held time in one hand and space in the other so that the continuum could continue. Understand, please, this is figurative language. <coughs> but can you imagine the power involved in the incarnation and in the subsequent events of eternity on earth? It is nothing less than the power of creation joined to the authority of judgment in the person of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. I don't know who I got this from, but it, I, I like it. Uh, it was nothing less than the power of creation joined to the authority of judgment in the person of Christ. It lasted from the incarnation to the ascension. Now, this is Sunday. Today is Sunday. And each Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Western churches emphasize the crucifixion while churches in the East emphasize the resurrection. Suffice it to say that resurrection demands crucifixion. Without resurrection, crucifixion means nothing. Now hear this. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He came out of the grave because death couldn't hold him who is life. And here's the point, and I want you to think about it. Without resurrection, humanity, without resurrection, humanity as one sinful dead body would drop into the fire that never shall be quenched. I thank God for Jesus Christ and the fact that he come, that he came, and that he died and that he rose again. That is a wonderful thing. It shows God's love. And we love him only because he loved us. Can you say from your heart, that I love God, I love Jesus Christ? If you can, it's because he died for you. And he loved you first. Without resurrection, like I said, humanity as one sinful dead body drops. The tear in time allowed eternity to accomplish redemption. Because he came out of the grave, he lives forever. And so do we who are in him. Is that not a glorious thought? This body may die, but I will never die. Never. He lives forever and so do we. We live as long as he lives. John 14, 18 and 19. And I, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye shall see me, because I live, ye shall live also. Because he lives, we live. And though I like bunny rabbits, Resurrection Sunday is not a bunny rabbit. And though I like ladies in dresses and pinafores and bonnets, resurrection is not feminine finery. Easter is not new dresses, shoes, and hats. And I like it when ladies wear hats and shoes and dresses. Resurrection Sunday is the celebration of a world-changing event. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a tear in time, resurrection fulfilled the purpose of incarnation. It worked forgiveness from sin. It brought salvation to God's elect. And it populated the right wing of the day of judgment. Christ's resurrection does that. It was part of the tear in time. The resurrection of Jesus Christ 
provided a place for God's elect, a place for us in eternity, and it was part of the tear in time, Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And I saw him, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet. And he said, he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the king's keys of hell and death. Jesus Christ has the key to your eternity. Listen to me, dear people. <clears throat> like, <clears throat> excuse me, like sand through an hourglass, time is running out. You who are lost, come to Christ right now, right where you sit. You ask for forgiveness from God Almighty, Jesus Christ. Beg for mercy now, because you may not have tomorrow. Proverbs 27.1 tells us this. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Come to Jesus Christ while you can. You may not have tomorrow. Tomorrow may not come. Father, we love thee, and today we need thee. Take these feeble words, Lord, and plant them deep within our hearts. Bring forth fruit to Jesus Christ. Bring forth fruit to glorify thee. Lord, save that soul nearest to hell. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.